Hi everyone, this is COVID, back with another episode of Beyond the Code by Typo. Today with us, we have an interesting guest whom we loved so much that we had to call him back. Our engineering metrics expert from Prague. He has 15 plus years of engineering leadership experience. He has been former vice president at Muse and currently a vice president engineering coach. Welcome back to the show, Marianne. Great to have you here. Greetings all, and uh, thank you, COVID, for having me once again. Uh, looking forward to it. Too. It will be a ride today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, Marian, uh, like today, the discussion topic is all around engineering metrics, as last right. time, and our audience loved it so much that we wanted to deep dive into certain topics and touch the fundamentals of DevOps, Dora, and discuss more on such topics with you, with certain examples that you have implemented or seen as. Uh, working well for different teams. So right. before we jump into the metrics and how to implement those, the first fundamental questions that I would like to have a clarity is what is DevOps and what is Dora? Okay, so uh, let's start with, with the DevOps first, I guess. So the way how I, how I perceive DevOps really is uh, some sort of a system, how to build software faster, like the operational side of things really. So to be very specific, specific in that, it uh, encompasses the, uh, for example, you know, the configuration cycle, the release cycle, altogether monitoring and uh, the tooling that we can combine all together. So in other words, it saves time and uh, make our developers uh, much more efficient as opposed to taking care of the, you know, low level stuff, let's put it this way. So uh, in other words, DevOps saves usually the time to engineers and uh, increases dramatically their, their efficiency and uh, basically their time to value. On the other hand, when it comes to the Dora metric itself, it's basically uh, uh, some sort of representation in numbers, how we can measure the team's efficiency, making sure that we uh, unlock uh, the potential of our teams and uh, keeping our teams on, let's say, in a, on a high performing level, right? And uh, there's a bunch of indicators. We might be talking about uh, Top five, top 10, uh, I would be honest, uh, it might be like up to a hundred of different indicators. Nevertheless, in Dora case, it's just four basic uh, indicators that we talk about and we could cover, cover that much more in depth, uh, you know, at our session. Perfect. Perfect. So to begin with, um, I think when we are talking about Dora metrics, can you give some example where exactly you feel that Dora metrics really fit for a particular team, what is the importance that this Dora metrics bring to the table and like what results can we get if we work on them? Okay. So, uh, I would say these days Dora metrics is some sort of a standard or established standard due to the fact that there has been a huge uh, research coming from Google. What, what are the, basically the most impactful metrics that we might want to follow, right? From my own perspective. Out of the four Dora metrics themselves, to me, the most important attribute of that or indicator of uh, efficiency is, for example, deployment frequency, where basically we are seeing how much time uh, it takes us to basically turn our effort into uh, a value, to be very practical, to basically t to move our new feature set into production, for example, right? And the reason why I think this metric is, uh, I would say, the most influential is, you know what, let's put it in a very simple example. If our team goes down for three months and uh, all of a sudden they release something, you know how it goes. We all heard the story, right? So they want to shake their hands because it's a huge success. But on the other hand, the product manager is saying, that's not really what I wanted. <laughs> the stakeholders are sort of, you know, reluctant to that. The clients might be saying like, you know, that's not what we meant to receive and the way how we work with. And there's a bunch of bugs for another two sprints out of it, right? I think we. We all experience this story. <laughs> so in the end of the day, what we want to see is that our deployment frequency is sort of frequent in a way that we release our increments in an established cadence, I would say, right? Here, I want to uh, basically pay attention to one of the things, which is usually we have to take into consideration the difference between, uh, let's say, a large corporate company and a small startup. Well, for example, speaking of the threshold, it's totally fine that I can imagine that in the startup environment or scale-up environment, we can have the deployment frequency about, let's say, that we release twice a day, right? That's totally fine. While in the, for example, regulatory banking business, if we release something on a monthly basis, that's a hell of a good, good achievement, right? So including the whole testing, the regressions and, the, you know, uh, regulatory constraints and so on and so forth. So uh, we always have to 
take the context into consider consideration. So don't mix, uh, you know, the, the startup metrics with, with the core protocols, right? So uh, that's so much yeah. in, uh, about the deployment frequency, in my opinion. Right. Actually, the in not just the team size, I think it's about how you function in what domain you are and yeah. what exactly you're working on. These metrics could vary for you and the benchmarks could vary for you. So I think that's a very good uh, point that you touched on. And it, I mean, we also generally look this from a very deep lens that, okay, yeah. what exactly is needed for this team, how they're functioning mm -hmm. right now, what should be the benchmark for this particular team if they're yeah. working on the front end, back end. So, of course, that that matters a lot. So, deciding on a particular metric and then setting up benchmarks is not just straightforward. Like, you just go and say, okay, we want five deployments per week and then we are yeah. sorted. That's, that's totally. not something we... Yeah. yeah, and if I may add another two cents to the story COVID, what I really found out is that actually what worked the best is that we set specific thresholds for specific teams because you might have different teams that work on the platform or enabling teams or basically the new vertical teams and so on and so forth. Some of the teams might have a high amount of dependencies and so on, uh, or there is a high amount of, for example, unplanned work uh, due to the maintenance and uh, other things. So it's really great to basically set up the different expectations or thresholds for the different teams. And the way how I do it, I ask the teams to come up with their own proposals. Oh, great. And it works because you don't break the principle of ownership. So just uh, take it aside as a small tip uh, and <laughs> we'll come back to, to our story for sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Absolutely. Marion, can you give me some other examples around how we can use these metrics to understand the problems of the team? Like I, just to just to give a head start there, maybe I'm yeah. looking for something that if we can understand how the code review process is going on in the team or how does the velocity of a team looks like or how does the collaboration looks like for a team? Okay. Uh, can, can we identify such kind of inefficiencies and like, problems in the team using these metrics? And if, if right. you know, like, can you give, give an example? Yeah, totally. Let's be honest. We can measure like dozens to hundreds of different things, uh, but that's not very wise, right? We have to start from somewhere. So usually the way how, how I approach it, especially when a company invites me to do some sort of internal efficiency audit, there are two types of inputs. First, the first input is really like talking with people, uh, with the right people and, uh, you know, open their heart and get all the insights uh, as much as possible. And of course, the second element of that is uh, data itself. So uh, looking into the data, seeing the uh, improvement opportunities there and uh, digesting the data the way that you can ident identify pretty well what might be the, the, the top root causes of uh, why the machinery is sort of uh, slower than expected, right? And here to be very specific, the one metric that I love looking at usually is the change failure rate, which is part of uh, still the DORA metrics, where basically uh, the change failure rate can be translated as, uh, in my opinion, team satisfaction. If we don't have a team that is satisfied, then uh, we can hardly achieve some sort of a, you know, highly performing team or environment. And the reason why I think there is a correlation between the two is that if me as a boss, I'm coming to my team every second time after they are really something and I'm telling them that, you know, they didn't uh, do the best job and, uh, you know, the production basically is full chaos, there's a failure and uh, there's an outage then of course it doesn't contribute to, to their satisfaction after they expect some kind words from my, from my side after releasing some sort of expected functionality, right? So having the change failure rate pretty low, meaning so let's say five to maximum 15% that says that, you know, there's a, a certain, although yet minimal probability that things go wrong after release something, that's, that's quite uh, important to see. There is a story that I'm usually saying that uh, my developers, they live out of motivation and satisfaction, right? So the motivation is basically why, why we are here, what mission we contribute and the satisfaction, what do we get back after we accomplish our work? So again, the change failure rate is something that is, I, in my opinion, highly underrated. And uh, some people don't see the correlation between, between the satisfaction and the, the change failure rate itself, right? So I think that this might be yet another practical example how to yeah, think of the metrics and uh, translate that to, to, the to the real world because without the true culture and, uh, you know, the satisfaction, you cannot achieve some sort of a high efficiency levels of, of your teams. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a very good example, actually. When you look at change failure rate, the first thing that would come to your mind is like, this metric can tell us how 
satisfied our customers would be. But looking at it from the other yeah. perspective where you're looking at team satisfaction, yeah. it makes a lot of sense actually. It's bi-directional. Um, I, uh, I had this one of our podcast guests uh, <laughs> whom uh, I was discussing these yeah. metrics. So he mentioned about using two uh, metrics. One is uh, comments per PR and okay. then commits after PRs are raised for review to understand whether the teams <laughs> are collaborating well and whether the initial code quality is good or not. And it was amazing when I when I looked at uh, the thought process, how he approached that. I uh-huh. was like pretty amazed. And that opened a few more doors of understanding how these engineering metrics work. Right. And thank you for introducing this example, because usually, you know, the people are getting crazy about the Dora metrics. In my opinion, it brings certain value. But uh, we need to read from the context. There are some, I would say, preconditions and uh, better opportunities to check before we start, you know, moving to Dora. What I mean to say, and again, another practical example is that I might have all the Dora metrics sort of, you know, positive thresholds and uh, that might signal us that, you know, the team is uh, hopefully high, highly performing. Nevertheless, if the team or my teams don't work on things that matter the most, meaning the roadmap, then we go belly up, right? So uh, what uh, I rather prefer looking at is, uh, you know, the, the, let's say, the portfolio investment, how much uh, of our, you know, efforts or talents efforts goes into the roadmap, into the product roadmap or technical roadmap or business as usual meaning of roadmap or another, let's say, improvement initiatives, new features and so on and so forth. And usually my advice is that we speak about, we talk about the, uh, let's say, product engineering teams, the teams that are basically implementing the new functionality, there I want to see that these teams usually, they contribute to the roadmap at minimum uh, 60% of their time, right? So uh, that makes me sure that actually I'm basically investing their talent wisely. Right. If I have, on the other hand, all the metrics that, you know, the velocity and, uh, you know, all the, all the as, you, yeah, as you've been saying, all the pull requests and comments uh, seems great. But if they don't work on things that matter the most, again, we are not going to shake our hands together. And uh, uh, that's, that's a waste of time. And uh, the funny thing is, it's not the fault of the team. It's the fault of me as their manager, of the, of the manager of the team, not of, of the first line manager, that I haven't taken care of that. So uh, don't, <laughs> let's don't use excuses about like, you know, this team is uh, either it's my team, it's not that highly performing and so on and so forth. It's bullshit. Sorry to put it this way. We are responsible for making sure that our teams work on the right things, that we are able to accomplish our roadmaps and our strategy, period. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think this makes a lot of sense. What I have felt so far talking to a lot of people about the matrix is that people do know about Tora matrix. They understand what engineering metrics are and measuring seems to be very obvious to like everyone. It's just the engineering department uh, where we are uh, having these kind of debates uh, on social media how to measure developer productivity or how to look at these yeah. Yeah. if you talk about other departments or business units of a business mm. like there are strong measurement tools in place who are using to measure the efficiency of let's say for a salesperson maybe we have tools like salesforce right it is one of the renowned examples right. Right. you can understand a lot about individual person on what he or she is doing how they're performing same goes for us but here the challenge so the main point that I'm trying to bring up here is that the challenge is that probably the engineering community is finding it difficult to make sense out of these metrics to solve their problems. And hence, right. I mean, this could be just my perception after talking mm-hmm. to a lot of people. But this is what I have felt. I'm not sure what's your opinion on that. I would love to know it. The biggest challenge is, of course, how to use them. And if you don't understand how to use them, automatically there is an inhibition to not implement such things. And then the bias goes towards uh, why to have these metrics? We should just look at the happiness of the team and that's all about it. If they're motivated, we are good about it. So, I mean, this is my observation. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good topic. Uh, thank you, COVID, for opening that. Sometimes I although, uh, I see uh, a huge entire pattern as well, which is like, you know, we implemented certain metrics, engineering efficiency metrics uh, in a company. We turn these metrics into basically... Uh, OKRs or indicators that are tied with the bonus, for example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy because people start to get gamified, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And yeah, uh, it yeah, all goes yeah. belly up. So, 
uh, that that's really like the the I would say the most severe anti pattern I've, I, I've experienced, right? And uh, to comment on uh, on your situation actually or your scenario, actually you are disclosing a very good point that I see happening. Yeah, basically, uh, quite it's an time. implementation challenge. Like, yeah. uh, there, there is a challenge with the implementation. I mean, you you must have faced different kind of situations where there would have been an implementation challenge. So I mean, yeah. just yeah. I just wanted to have your opinion on that. Yeah. So uh, right, the the most I would say challenging situation while implementing these metrics is that usually companies uh, start from the middle. The way how I see it, and that's one of the you know the most frequent anti, anti patterns is that let's implement a certain solution out of the box that implements Dora space or whatever that is. Of course, we have to adjust our existing Jira and uh, to do some cleanup. <laughs> that's a secret story, yeah. and it takes yeah. some time, right? Uh, to, to comply with the standards, then uh, all the numbers come up, right? And you have uh, great dashboards with great colors and everything. But the challenge is exactly as you described, COVID, is uh, to make a decision. What are, out of these 20 different indicators, the, the top three or top four that we really want to focus and uh, how to set the, the thresholds properly so we know what it means if it turns, you know, what's the severity of uh, of that metrics if it turns uh, from green to orange or from orange to, to red, basically, right? So without having this exercise and the decision making about like, you know, what are the main indicators that we really want to follow instead of like, you know, we have the full dashboard, it's your responsibility now as a, as a new team leads to have all these uh, numbers green, right? So, and uh, yeah. these guys, they are basically lost in that, right? So that's one of the things I want yeah. to add another uh, example, uh, sure. which is, you know, basically what I'm saying to the companies and to the clients is that implementing metrics or certain efficiency indicators, it's uh, one third of the story. Another two thirds is how to adopt these metrics into the company, right? It's not about like, you know, we just did a Jira, we signed a contract, uh, here's the dashboard. From now on, you are good to go and blessed to uh, be a high performing team because of the numbers, right? It doesn't work it doesn't this way. Work. So, uh, making sure that people understand why we want to implement these metrics, what's the motivation and, uh, explaining and massaging them all the time about like, what's the purpose of that? Because yes. usually, you know, let's be honest, what's the most frequent fra phrase we hear from, uh, for example, the developers or team leads, usually they are telling us, you know, uh, get screwed with your metrics. You, you want to basically, uh, micromanage us, right? Exa exactly. Yeah. And, uh, turning that, let's say that change because we talk about the change management in the end of the day. It's not about changing the, the process, but also changing the people's mindset and their perception on this uh, matter, on this subject. So usually what I advise uh, the teams and the companies is uh, to change the narrative from, uh, you know, we want to micromanage you and making sure that you are highly performing to stick to, to basically two principles. The first principle is transparency, meaning it's even better if it's part of our values or openness or something similar to that, because in the end of the day, I want to see and uh, have a way to where to look to see uh, real time data, which team is highly performing or which is not that highly performing. Right. And it's, it's fully transparent. This, this is what it is guys. And, uh, let's digest it and let's improve. Right? The other thing is, uh, the other principle that I want to follow is, uh, prevention basically. And here the metrics themselves. Uh, I'm going to use some curse words, sorry for that, but, uh, it saved my, it saved my ass quite a lot of times. So that's the fact, right? When I saw that, for example, some of the, some of the indicator goes totally down or belly up or something is happening uh, with the, with the culture or relationship with the manager, when it comes to some sort of, you know, happiness indicators or that the yeah. number frequency go, you know, is getting worse or, you know, the change fail rate is like, you know, moving up to, let's say 40% in the last two months, then, uh, that's an indicator that, uh, something is fishy there. And if I have, if I, if I wouldn't have these numbers, I wouldn't be aware of that situation. I wouldn't be able to react. I wouldn't be able to ask the team lead, my team lead, Hey Mike, please, uh, in the next one-on-one, -on -one, uh, with all the guys, please tell, ask them the same question, what's going on, how, how we can improve it or what's, what's happening there. If I don't have the numbers, I cannot basically, uh, react and, uh, eventually I might end up with uh, a totally deteriorated team and uh, that I will have to rebuild and it will take me another half a year. So what I'm trying to say is having a well-established metrics 
is something that really pays off in the end of the day when you compare it with, uh, let's say, the waste of the time that some sort of inefficiency can create and uh, having the situation when the team is sort of uh, rotting and underperforming. Right. So that's usually what I see. And uh, the third thing that I want to open here, COVID, sorry for speaking too much. One of that, the I think it's very interesting. Uh, sometimes uh, while implementing the indicators, sometimes I see that people look at these indicators as sort of KPIs as opposed to indicators only. So uh, what I mean to say, we really need to be careful about how we translate the numbers to be very specific. For example, uh, for example, if I see that one single individual contributor has a low amount of pull requests, right? And we are two weeks before, let's say the, the performance reviews, review process. So uh, what do I do? Do I come up with a number and, uh, and say, hey, Patrick, you, you, you are screwed? <laughs> or do I take the context into consideration by knowing that Patrick is a senior developer and uh, his strength is to enable other people? Therefore, what he's doing for me is that he's pairing with other guys, right? So he's sort of, I would say, invisible in the process, but his value is amazing and is great. It's huge, right? So always take these numbers into consideration. That That's my... It's, it's indicators. So be careful about how you how you basically treat these numbers and how you communicate the numbers. So uh, my my message would be make sure that you stay on the positive line all the time. Uh, yeah, everybody is able to sh shout. Uh, uh, I would be really careful about it. Yeah, totally. I think. And one more important thing, I uh, like you you mentioned about what kind of uh, prerequisite in a culture you should have, and then yeah. how you should go about looking at these metrics where you tell everyone what is the motivation behind doing right. it. You, you answer the why's for the people and bring in that innate motivation for everyone to look at those metrics as indicators of how work should proceed or how efficiency should look like. And yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree to that. From your experience, can you tell us, is there an average time for a team to adopt these metrics? Like how much duration should people wait for having these phases of implementation because I personally have seen uh, with Typo that we, we are implementing with teams and sometimes what happens is like a few teams do it within one to two months of implementation. Like they bring in the dashboard and they just have certain goals set up for the team. They identify the issues and they start up with it. And sometimes it takes more than three months also for teams to get gelled up with it. What's your take on that part? Like how much time does it take for mm -hmm. usually for the teams to? Uh, that's a great topic. And thank you for opening that. My experience tells me that usually it's roughly three months three to months. onboard uh, all, all the teams, let's say six to 10 plus teams uh, towards the metrics to explain them, like what's the reason behind, how to use them, how to translate them and so on and so forth. Plus, uh, let's be honest, implementing this functionality or, or indicators to the efficiency process of your company, as we are saying, it's not just the change of the process, it's also the mindset change, right? The best thing is really to, for example, you know, involve, for example, the team leads into that, this transformation early on, right? So they are part of these conversations, explaining them the motivation once again, making sure that they are in the center of our decision-making process. For example, uh, I may be coming from my internal audit with, let's say, out of the 15 with the seven or top eight different indicators that I think that are the most influential ones, right? And But uh, it's them who are saying in the end how they see it from their own uh, perspective, right? And what are the, let's say, the, the, the final top four that we will start with, right? When it comes to the implementation, of course, the implementation, that's the hard work. Uh, and, as, and as I was saying, the dirty secret is that you have to do a cleanup of your ticketing system because, because you know, if your data is screwed, uh, your numbers will be screwed as well. <laughs> no surprise here. And uh, in the end, of course, it's about, uh, you know, doing some sort of, I would say, town halls and workshops with all, all the teams, including the product managers, the developers and others. So they understand the numbers and everybody's on the same page, right? Including that. And again, the trick that I'm uh, using quite a lot is that actually I'm not saying what are the thresholds. Of course, I'm sort of, I would say, lobbying for what the thresholds might be, but I'm asking the teams to come up with, with their own thresholds, right? As a proposal, of course, we challenge each other. And this way I make sure that basically they own it from zero, uh, from day zero, right? Or day one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's a trick that, that I use uh, quite often. 
the, that being said, if I see, for example, to be very practical, if I see one of the teams uh, that's not like, you know, taken up fast enough, basically uh, the, the agreement is, okay, take it easy. No, no worries here. Uh, usually there is another, let's say situation that is not technical. Maybe it's cultural or may, maybe it's personal situation. <laughs> that's my experience that makes number numbers go down. Right. And, uh, we invest a certain time to improve, you know, the root cause and, or to, to basically work on the root cause. And after the number starts to, you know, uh, go to a reasonable level, then we say, okay, this team from now on is enabled and is using the, the metrics, uh, you know, in full functionality, basically. So what I mean to say the entire pattern, in other words, is say, okay, so these are the generic metrics. Let's, let's do it without, you know, not having the context about what the team is about. And, or, and the idea in that pattern is basically to say like, you know, this is the start and, uh, from now on, everybody has to be compatible with, uh, with the thresholds, which, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, there are, let's say interpersonal reasons or some sort of cultural reasons why things what might not be working as expected. Yeah. Uh, and here I want to basically double down this message, <laughs> uh, cause usually, you know, the CTO is saying, okay, let's implement the metrics. And from now on, uh, you know, I will have a high, high performing teams, right? But, uh, if you have a rotting situation or the product manager is not in synergy with the engineering manager or whomever, and, uh, there's some toxicity, let's be honest, uh, in the team, no metrics will help you. <laughs> so exactly. having, using the, the excuse of, you know, here's the numbers and, uh, you know, work your ass off never helps. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think I can't agree more on that. I think once you have this implementation in place, I'm just moving on to the next piece where I, I see teams implementing it, spending those one or two months or three months of time to get that into the picture where everyone is aligned. Now, how does this process of identifying different areas of inefficiency starts? And just for example, like if, if I have a problem with the initial code quality in the team, or let's say if I have a problem of deliverability uh, in the team where uh, maybe we are taking too long to deliver epics and uh, if there are like too many bugs coming in and there is high resolution time for the bugs right so which is directly impacting the delivery of the product with the yeah. customer so there could be a lot of areas where we can just start off like today I'm an engineering manager I might get overwhelmed with areas where I can work on and I, I will not be sure that okay which metrics should I choose so can you give some examples which not only include Dora, but maybe we can just look at things beyond Dora and find out areas where an engineering manager or an engineering leader can get help on understanding where things are going wrong and how exactly one could improve on those. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's a great topic, COVID. So surprise, surprise. <laughs> In my opinion, uh, the most uh, crucial indicators are not part of Dora. Because uh, first yeah. of all, I want to make sure that one, that the teams do, uh, do know what they are supposed to work on and, uh, they are able to get focused on that. Right. Dora says nothing about it. And usually <laughs> that's one of the most frequent root causes that I see in the companies to be very specific. The situations that I see the most often is that when we start to measure the, I call it roadmap contribution, meaning how much time we spend our talent spends on, on the roadmap to, on the things that matter the most. If we start to measure it and you can do it very simply, you just, uh, you know, put the, uh, tasks or stories that are part of, of the roadmap. Usually they belong to certain increments as epics, right? Yeah. You can label these epics by, let's say the, the quarter or something of, of that year. We are 2024 Q1 or whatever, right? Yeah. So okay. this way you can distinguish, uh, you know, whether that increments belong to an epic or not. And, uh, if I have a task that, uh, has a parent epic with that label, that clearly signals me that it contributes that, right? And just measuring, for example, the cycle time as, uh, of the, these tasks, that's the basic unit, unit, meaning, you know, how much time it takes from, uh, start, uh, how much time it's the ticket is in progress and, uh, comparing the summary of, you know, the total amount of, of the cycle time in the last three months, for example, with the ratio of, uh, only the cycle time of the task that, that contributes to the roadmap, that's already a hell of a good in indicator. And, uh, as I was saying, usually I want to see that it's roughly about, let's say if we, if we have a, let's say, let's say high maintenance team, of course, it might be like, you know, just 30 to 40%. I understand that because there's quite a lot of bugs and, uh, support tasks, uh, getting in right. On the other hand, 
if we have a, let's say, a small startup team, there I want to see that the contribution, the roadmap contribution is close to 90%. So the reason why is that they have no production bugs, they have no production support uh, issues and so on and so forth, right? And uh, if we, let's be, let be real, if we are something about 55 to 60%, and we spend most of the time on things that are matter the most with our teams, then that's a, that's a good achievement. So what I mean to say, the situation usually is that after we start measuring these things, we find out that our teams have a scattered focus and uh, uh, there's quite a lot of unplanned work coming in. And uh, actually, uh, uh, the roadmap contribution is, let's say, 35% only. And everybody gets surprised about it, right? Nobody yeah. has measured that. So the, the top managers, they think that, that our teams work on the roadmap. <laughs> A product manager is still complaining that, you know, he doesn't get enough attention. The support is complaining that, for example, you know, uh, the, the amount of bugs is still increasing and so on and so forth. So if you at least uh, create some sort of expectations and uh, basically the balance between between that, that's, that's a hell of a good achievement already. And say clearly that, for example, yeah, for this quarter, I want to see that this, this quarter we spent 55% on, on the, let's say, product roadmap, uh, 25% on the technical roadmap. And let's say another, the, the rest, uh, which is 20% on the off-road map, right? Usually, again, if you start measuring it, you will, but you, you might get surprised that the off-road map piece is 60% or 65%. Tell me how the raw metrics can help you if, if you have this issue. <laughs> uh, so that's one of the things that I want to highlight. The second indicator is uh, focus. No surprise. H how much able uh, my teams are to keep focused, right? For example, what I'm measuring, what I, what, I, what I love observing is how many tickets in progress per person in a team we have. You would be surprised how, uh, how high the coloration is between the, uh, you know, the, the focus factor and the efficiency of the team. In terms of the focus, I want to see, for example, I'm telling it as a story. So I want to see that uh, each single person has maximum two tickets open in progress in parallel. I want to see that the whole team has maximum two increments or epics opened in parallel. You might be uh, saying like, why, why two, why not three? Uh, there's a third hidden epic, <laughs> which is business as usual, the off-road map. Take that into consideration. I want to see that uh, on the, uh, let's say, department level, we work maximum on two large initiatives, right? The company level, I want to see that we work maximum on two OKRs in parallel, not five, not 10, right? That creates focus. If you don't yeah. have these sort of work in progress limits, you cannot make sure that the focus is there, right? So uh, just making sure that th this one works, all of a sudden you would see that the teams can start to breathe, right? So because the entire pattern usually is that we have a team of five people and each every person is working on a, on a, on a different uh, uh, increment, on a different epic. Tell me if this is the team or it, this is the bunch of individuals, right? There is no teamwork in my opinion. There is no knowledge sharing. You cannot help each other. You cannot, you know, start finishing. You just, uh, or, uh, you know, the, the system doesn't work. It's broken. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So again, the raw metrics in this case won't help or pull request uh, metrics, whatever metrics based on pull requests will not help us here. Right. So uh, that's one of the things. Another thing or the third thing, and sorry, COVID once again for being too much talkative. I know. And uh, this is the one that I love. Uh, talking about. I will describe it as a, as a story, right? Uh, sometimes I get invited to companies and uh, I hear that, you know, uh, my teams haven't delivered uh, on the roadmap for the third quarter. I don't know what to do. Uh, please have a look. <laughs> Usually, you know, it's not about the delivery. Usually the teams are performing pretty well. Of course, you can improve certain things and ceremonies and the flow and improve the uh, overall efficiency of the teams by, let's say, uh, well, uh, 10 to 30%, which is pretty nice. Okay. Sometimes what gets broken is uh, the discovery, meaning like, you know, the specification or, you know, the purpose on, on uh, uh, what are the things that we, we have to work on or we want to work on and what's the most valuable thing that we have to work on. There is some sort of uh, disconnect between the product and uh, the team, the engineering team. So again, you need to rather work on the uh, continued discovery in these things. That's what helps the most because if you, you, you know the story, trash in, trash out, right? So again, I'm telling the story, why the heck do you do, do you pay high performing teams and these teams are usually very expensive if you throw trash on them? It's, it's not worth it. It's not worth the investment, right? And the one single thing that I wanted to highlight is uh, 
synergies. To be very practical, I can increase the efficiency of a team by, let's say, dozens of percent, right? By measuring uh, things that matter the most. Nevertheless, uh, if we create a synergy between the product manager and, the, and our engineering manager and the whole team, then all of a sudden we are getting 300% boost. So there is what I mean to say, there is something more than numbers. Surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is. So these are the things that I usually, you know, observe. So it's part of the numbers, the data, talking with people, the culture, the synergies that tells us the most, right? And only after we start to pick the, the most uh, useful indicators, such as roadmap contribution or focus time or epic cycle time or team satisfaction and so on and so forth. So that's, that's my advice. Yeah. Totally makes sense. And I think looking at epic cycle time or roadmap contribution gives a lot of clarity on how what we are exactly doing and are we headed yeah. in the right direction or not. These are two very good indicators and I think very good for anyone to start off also. Like yeah. for anyone to start off looking at what are the metrics which we should focus on at this point in time as a startup or as even a mid-sized team. This makes a lot of lot of sense actually. Right. One more thing uh, just uh, I, I just want to discuss on this part is like when we are looking at these metrics, uh, there mm -hmm. is of course not just things around deliverability and once you understand that part what are the next steps that you have to take so i i get to know that okay my team has lower contribution towards roadmap or our epic cycle time is high so what kind of execution steps should we take there and are there any metrics involved that would help us understand whether the execution towards those is going right or not so just to give you an example like okay epic cycle time is too high for my team and I started to look at what where is the problem and I found out that one of the biggest bottlenecks was my deployment cycle and every time a PR was ready to be merged to the production everything was there the builds took a lot of time and every right. month almost 15 deployments were being done whereas where PRs were already pushed at let's say in 6 to 8 hours or 10 hours of time so basically, what happened was that every month we were wasting 50% of the time in getting those deployments done swiftly. And yeah. ultimately, this became a reason for epic cycle time to be too high for the team, right? And yeah. if you look at it on a daily basis, you might feel as an engineering manager, there is a bottleneck. But when you look at it from a quarter's perspective, where you see your epic cycle time for a lot of epics was almost two to three times of what you were expecting. You would be yeah. amazed to see that and you would want to take certain steps. So I just wanted to understand like today, if I understand roadmap contribution is low, what steps should I take and how even the matrix can help in that situation? Okay. So uh, we might picture a couple of scenarios here, all right? You described pretty well the epic cycle time and what might be the root cause. And usually we, uh, you know, no surprise, here we talk about our ability to uh, do a drill down just to analyze yeah. where this number is coming from and so on and so forth. Exactly as precisely as you described, uh, if the epic cycle time is, is too large or too yeah. high, I want to see what are the specific uh, subsequences in the cycle time of implementing a certain increment as an epic. It might be either the deployment time or the testing or or the adoption and so on and so forth. And uh, if we identify what's the, you know, the root cause or what's the largest chunk <laughs> that basically uh, consumes most of our effort, then we can, uh, again, uh, narrow down uh, what uh, to do that root cause and do some sort of uh, adjustments and uh, basically uh, healing scenarios uh, just to make sure that things work. And it might be either some sort of automation steps or making sure that we improve the whole process uh, overall, uh, either manually or by the process or, as, you know, as I was saying, the automation. Or basically we say, like, you know, we can have, a, let's say, software constraints in certain scenarios when we, for example, release only some sort of betas or MVPs and so on and so forth, right? So we don't have to have or uh, a complete checklist of uh, definition uh, of ready into production, right? In this case. So there are certain scenarios how to, how to treat these things. The other example that I find quite useful, for example, I want to close the loop uh, uh, and we started with, with the satisfaction of people. Here, of course, there's a couple of uh, tools and uh, ways how to basically measure the team satisfaction. And again, this is one of the surprises that, that I've discovered. And I was really pleased by that uh, to see how much such a metric can help me to make sure that my teams stay on the 
high performing level and the culture is existing there. Well, to be very practical, if I have a tool that tells me that, you know, the score from, let's say, zero to 10 in terms of uh, the relationship with the manager or relationship with the peers or the satisfaction or the wellness is uh, roughly about, let's say, eight to nine, that's totally fine. But if I see a drop from eight to two with the relationship with the manager, then, uh, and, it, and it's me being a manager, then I know that there is something that I should be eventually working on, right? So, yeah. and again, it's a great act of uh, prevention. And without these data, sometimes we don't have the wake up call, right? So that's yet uh, another example how we can, we can help each other. And uh, again, if I see this number, then of course, what we can do is again, to, uh, to, to do the drawdown, to ask the people for the feedback, to ask yeah, for the exactly. data, uh, and so on and so forth. Because in the end of the day, the data is what matters the most, right? If, if we, let's say, undercover our hypothesis by data, then uh, we feel pretty strong into our uh, assumption and we already know what might be the root cause and how to basically uh, prevent uh, the situation from rotting and destabilizing the whole team or the whole department. So these are usually the, uh, the scenario that I see repeated uh, quite often. So the message here is, once again, as we said from the very beginning, don't treat these indicators as KPIs or hard data. Make sure that you understand the context first. You do the drill down. You do your homework. <laughs> and only then start talking about it. Because uh, if you use it uh, in an incorrect manner, uh, it will bite you back. Yeah, of course. Cool. cool. Okay. I think, Marian, uh, this was a great conversation. I think we can have many more such discussions yeah. and keep diving <laughs> in different use cases. But in the interest of time, and uh, for this particular episode, let's close it here and look forward to having another such episode where we are talking more in depth about the problems that the team face with these metrics. Uh, great, Marian, once again, thanks a lot for bringing yeah. in such practical advice around metrics. I'm sure people, audience is going to love it and I love it too. <laughs> Thank you, Kovic, for having me here. Uh, looking forward for our next session and uh, uh, let's make the world better. <laughs> Absolutely. See you soon. Absolutely. See you. <laughs>